somehow science is taking a back seat in many countries. And so uh, uh, it is particularly important because in climate change, the world is already experiencing climate change. And uh, for the next 10 to 20 years, it's going to get worse and worse. And then it could improve if the world pays attention to the science and starts cutting down emissions. Uh, if we continue business as usual, a lot of the doomsday scenario we were talking about a few decades ago, we thought it was end of the 21st century. Now it's clear this so-called unthinkable two degree warming, as was said by the UN Secretary General, seems to be unstoppable. And it could happen, like I said yesterday, 35 years from now by mid-century. And, and this is where I think the last three to five years, I've been thinking of this problem as uh, there are really two worlds. You know, economists used to think, talk about first world and the third world. I don't know why they dropped the second world, first and third. And I think that concept needs to be changed. So I think in terms of the top one billion people, and then the, I call them bottom three billion or poorest three billion. And the reason I want to go away from the developed and developing world is this top one billion are now everywhere. And of course, concentrated in Europe and US, but now we have India, China, which is good that we have wealthy people everywhere. But these wealthy people are the most polluters, climate change pollution. And when you, we are already experiencing droughts and floods. There was floods in Germany. Texas was buried under six feet of water, parts of Texas. So these poor are everywhere. But the poor I'm concentrating are the poorest three billion who have no access or can't afford fossil fuels. And, uh, and, and the World Health Organization, World Bank, and others have all come with an estimate but 2.7 billion, I round it off to 3 billion, are still burning firewood and dung and others for their basic cooking. And the worst sufferers are women and girls, because they're the ones asked to pick up the firewood. Typically, they walk about a kilometer to two kilometers every day, and they have to walk to get water. So, as the world is now, because of the Paris Agreement, we agree we'll cut down the pollution. What I am pushing for, and the, it's just not me, many, many, hundreds if not thousands of scientists are pushing for it, that we have to give clean energy access to the poorest three billion. So they are burning clean fuels and protecting lives, so three million die from smoke inhalation. And when there is drought, they have electricity to pump water from the ground. And so basic needs. So to me, that is the highest priority in climate change mitigation adaptation, giving energy, clean energy access to the poor. Um, success against poverty globally is partly creating environmental problems. It's not a win-win. Economic growth is simultaneously reducing poverty in the world, but increasing the problems of environmental pollution, carbon emissions, and so on. But we also have to realize that the nature of that trade-off is not fixed the effect of economic growth on environmental out outcomes it depends on the technology and it depends on the policies. 
given technology and given policies, economic growth tends to increase carbon emissions, there's no doubt about that, um, and it also tends to increase certain pollutants. However, technology and policies can change, and that alters the trade-off. One of the challenges we face is the relationship between inequality and environmental degradation and carbon emissions. Um, yes, richer people tend to pollute less, but at the margin, poorer people, the extra income going to poorer people tends to increase things like carbon emissions more than the same extra income to rich people. Because in rich countries you have better regulations, you have better ways of inf using technology, better policies and better technologies. So one of the challenges we face is how to get the technological improvements into poor settings that would, be, would, would improve this trade-off, which would make it possible to have poverty reduction in a, in a cleaner world and, a, and a, a less warm world. And those are severe challenges going forward. The objective I, I set, which became the, one of the Sustainable Development Goals, that objective is to bring the poverty rate globally down to 3% by 2030. Now, people use this word eliminate rather loosely. 3% um, is not eliminate. The last few percent will be very difficult. Uh, I, I think much harder than the next uh, 7%. But um, I think we can. That would be a huge achievement. That would be basically lifting one billion people out of extreme poverty within 15 years. Uh, that's a, that's, and that's heavy lifting too. It is not, um, it's not going to be easy. <coughs> But when I say it's feasible, it's feasible since it can be predicted based on the, an extrapolation of current policies in successful developing countries, as long as we can keep a lid on total inequality. Uh, I think that's feasible. Uh, global inequality is actually falling, it's not rising. Um, so at least if we can prevent a rise in global inequality going forward, then we will be able to reach this goal. But the goal literally is 3% by 2030. It's not 0%. Um, and that, that qualification is quite important because I don't think, what I'm saying is that the policies now, in the best, the best policy environments in the developing world, those policies are adequate to achieve that goal. They're not adequate to totally eliminate extreme poverty. That will require extra effort to reach the very poorest is harder. They're often in more remote areas. There are, are ethnic and linguistic frictions. There are all kinds of problems. So the, the status quo in policy will not be enough. We will need new policies to get that last, to get that true elimination. Okay, so status quo, good status quo, will get us a billion people out of poverty. It'll still leave a number, <laughs> I would guess around 3% of the, of the population in the developing world, and that's going to require some really heavy lifting on policy, some significant changes in policy. I'll tell you one of the few documents which talks about the interlinkage between the physical system, the ecology, and the social systems is the Laudato Si. You know, Pope Francis, is, there's a complete chapter on integral ecology. I now recommend this to all my students to read, and it talks about that interaction. And so let me give you my personal examples. Again, uh, I'm a natural scientist. I'm not a social scientist, but my work has forced into that arena and so when we say poverty and environmental degradation, we are talking about local environment, cutting trees to burn, cooking, and depleting the soil of the moisture. But when I talk about climate change, that's a global degradation. That's done by the wealthy, one billion. And since that climate change is going to cause droughts and floods. 
and since this three billion depend on subsistence farming, I, I, in my own mind, I think, if climate change progresses the way we are forecasting until 2030, my feeling is it's going to increase poverty, not decrease. It might offset all the benefits we come from, get from development ec economics. So we have to consider both. And, and in my community, the estimates of what we call climate refugees, because sea level goes up. Bangladesh, just take South Asia where I come from. There are a billion Hindus. On one side is 200 million Muslims, and the other hand, comparable. Already is a sensitive issue, and you bring in droughts, you bring in sea level going up. We used to think of one meter sea level end of the century. Just three years ago, five glaciology groups have convincingly shown two huge West Antarctic glaciers are an unstable melting. When we scientists say unstable, you can't stop it. Even if you cut down the pollution, that, those glaciers would melt. That alone would con contribute a meter sea level rise. So what, happened, what are we going to do if that creates hundred, few hundred million refugees? I don't see, I see how Europe is suffering with one million. There's just no, we need to think about institutions to deal with these. So I clearly see the climate issue. Again, please don't confuse that with what development folks say, environmental degradation, that's local degradation. I'm talking about global decoration. That comes from us. So we, we, scientists like me have to start working very closely with scientists like Martin, other economists. So we, we can't remain separated anymore. The cli climate change refugee problem, the refugee problem globally, not just climate change, is, is going to, um, continue and is um, a severe problem. Um, that's another collective action problem. But here the problem is we don't have a global government. The collective action problems which I mentioned before, we at least have a government we can point to within for policy problems within countries. A lot of these global public good problems like climate change and, and refugees are across borders. It, they require international cooperation and we don't have the institutions. We simply don't have the global institutions to deal with this. Um, the UN is important and has played a very positive role, um, but we haven't, individual governments haven't given institutions like the UN and the World Bank the kind of mandate they really need to address these global public goods problems. And there's a host of them. And, uh, international migration, um, for, forced international migration due to civil wars, uh, environmental problems, and, um, and, and, and climate change included, um, are within that category. And this is a severe problem. But it's an institutional problem, and, 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 and the way to solve it is to strengthen the global institutions, to give them the power to do something about this.